There we go. All right, so here's a brief outline of uh, what I'm going to cover. Um, first, how have New York City coastal flood hazards changed? Um, we just published a research paper showing how things have evolved since the 1800s. Second, uh, what's our best current estimate of um, flooding at various return periods, five years, 10 year floods, 100 year floods? Um, how can estuary restoration affect flood hazards? Um, I'm not actually going to go into detail on sea level rise, the future sea level rise. I think people have seen uh, that a lot, but um, I could speak to that in the question and answer afterwards. Um, but I'm going to more focus on what's happened already and, and where we are now. Um, then I'll talk about how can estuary restoration of different sorts affect flood hazards um, by reducing waves, reducing flood height. Also, at a deeper level, how um, we can, by restoring the estuary, we can have more interaction of society with the estuary and have it be more of a place for recreation. And, and thereby improve societal resilience to flooding or understanding of the flood hazard. Um, and, and lastly, I'll briefly speak to what are the primary unknowns when it comes to the oceanography or the physics of um, just mainly focused on flooding here um, of estuary restoration. Next slide. So uh, this paper that we just published um, with a collaborator of mine, uh, Stephen Paul, uh, he scanned data back to the 1800s to the 1840s of um, of storm tide events in New York Harbor. So we've got this amazing new data set um, going back almost twice as far. You know, until recently you could only get data from 1927 until the present. So we really didn't have nearly the picture we have now of storm tides going back all the way to 1840, um, 1840s. Um, and what you see just looking at this, this is the different colors are different locations, and each um, vertical bar is the annual maximum storm tide height. So tide plus storm surge. Um, so the flooding events back in the 1800s were a lot smaller. And this is, um, sea level rise is not part of this. It's been, the mean sea level for each year has been subtracted out. So these are just the wind and pressure and tide driven flood heights. So um, the annual uh, maximum storm tides were a lot smaller in the 1800s than they are now. So there's a mystery to solve here, which we don't have the answer to yet, but is this due to just regular climate variability, perhaps emergence from the Little Ice Age, um, is it due to climate change, global warming, or is it due to human changes made to the harbor? Um, for example, elimination of wetlands, dredging of channels, etc. Next slide. Um, so, and, and then I'm not going to go dwell on this too long, but just giving more detail that's also in the paper is the red line shown here is the 10 year flood event, the blue line is the five year flood event. So, in this paper, we're just looking at, uh, we're not treating these as a stationary thing. That, that doesn't change over the past 150 years, we're treating it as something that's evolving. And so you can see that the, um, the red line shows about a 28 centimeter, almost a foot increase in the 10-year the storm tide since 1800. If you add in the sea level rise part of it, then that's another 44 centimeters, you've got 72 centimeters, or two and a half feet of increase in our 10-year flood. So a really pretty large increase has already happened in the past um, in, our, in our flood heights in New York Harbor. Next slide. And so now, um, if, if somebody asked me to tell them what the four-year flood, you know, 25% probability per year, or 10% per year, 10-year flood, is I have pretty good answers based on that paper, um, and that's just looking at the past 37-year window of data, and also the sea level rise, or the sea level for 2014. I can tell you that uh, the four-year flood height, uh, actually storm tide is 1.75 meters, the 10-year flood height, or no, actually this is with sea level rise. Um, relative to today's mean sea level. It's, uh, it's two meters um, mean sea level, which is about the, um, enough to flood, start flooding South Street Seaport and a few other neighborhoods. So 1.75 meters is just a seawall height, and it only floods a few neighborhoods around the city, but not the most populated neighborhoods. So we kind of have a good sense of that. But for the 100-year flood, there's these different studies that all have completely different answers. Um, Anything from about two meter flood height, which actually we would say is about the 10 year flood. So I totally disagree that that's a 100 year flood height down here. But then FEMA's study said it's um, about four feet higher than that, more than four feet higher than that. So there's clearly no agreement on what a 100 year flood really is for, for New, York, New York, New Jersey Harbor right now. So that's a big problem, something that we're working on. Next slide. Um, one thing that we do have a better sense of, actually, in a way, is the flood hazard curve. So. What's shown here is the Netherlands in the blue line, New York Harbor in the red line. This is 10 year, 100 year, 1,000 year flood event, and 10,000 year flood event, which pretty low probability, but um, it's maybe useful to contemplate or not. You can argue, you can debate. But the, you know, you often hear how the Netherlands is prepared for the 10,000 year flood event, you know, 
But what this shows is it's not necessarily such a big deal. I mean, it's easier for them because they don't get hurricanes. Um, it's only about uh, three feet higher than their 100-year flood event. So it's an easy decision to make to build another three feet higher. And, and also, much of their country is below sea level, so they really need to get to that level. Um, they don't have much high ground. Um, so New York City does have a lot of high ground, so that's one big difference. But what I'm highlighting here is, and this is FEMA's um, hazard curve, which, you know, like I showed in the last slide, there's a lot of debate on um, if this is too high, um, if these flood heights estimated by FEMA's new study are too high. And I think they are um, higher, higher than, um, well, they're definitely higher than some other studies, so there's, there's some debate to be had there. But, but whichever study you look at that includes hurricanes, it still has the Lynn et al. study has a much lower line down here, but it's still got that same slope to it. And so what it means is your, your thousand year flood, for example, versus your 10 year flood is more like 10 feet higher. And your 10,000 year flood is 11.7 feet higher, shown down here in terms of just thinking about the vertical extent you know, at the waterfront. It's 11.7 feet higher than the 100 year flood. So if, you're, if you, as New York City is doing, design your, your flood protections for the 100 year flood plus three feet of sea level rise, you know, if you get a thousand year event, then you're still going to be overtopped by quite a bit. So this range of the, of the flood, the possibilities due to hurricanes being very vulnerable to hurricanes is a real issue here. So my takeaways from this, and this does kind of drift into my interpretation, but this, you know, you can really stare at this and think deeply about it and come up with different interpretations of what it means politically or for society, but um, there's no such thing, one thing we could probably agree on is there's no such thing as coastal protection at New York City. There can be risk reduction. You can, you can make it less likely um, that you'll get flooded, but you can't ever necessarily completely stop the chance of flooding. Um, se secondly, it's, it can be dangerous to focus on vertical barriers because they can always be overtopped by a, by a bigger storm event. Um, it can be better to focus, maybe wiser, especially with accelerating sea level rise that may reach meters per century, uh, you know, within the next century or two, it likely will. Um, it may be wiser to focus more on elevating neighborhoods or systems um, or in some cases retreating from ones that are the lowest neighborhoods over the next, over the gradual time scale of sea level rise over 100 years or so. Um, also, and, and my take also sort of is that it's better to focus on anti-fragile systems that bend but don't break, like a, a levee system that could fail is a, is a, is a fragile system. Um, and if it just gets over top, even if it doesn't fail, suddenly you have very rapid water entering a neighborhood in a very dangerous way. So that's more of a fragile protection system, whereas an anti-fragile system always reduces the flooding, but it doesn't aim to stop it. Um, and so it doesn't fool people into thinking they're, quote, protected, if they can't be protected completely. Next slide. So now talking about uh, adaptation strategies and restoration, how it can fit into this. Here's a slide showing just a, a summary of a few things. Um, so one, one idea we've had is um, reversing deep dredging in places where shipping channels aren't used anymore, and there's not many of those places, but it's, it's one option. Or you might also imagine this for, um, for uh, the, the bays of New Jersey and the southern uh, Long Island um, it, as inlet, um, you know, reversing inlet dredging that's been, um, you know, with deep channels. Another. Opportunities with restoring wetlands and islands, as shown for these Jamaica Bay projects, which have been very successful, bringing back uh, wetland grasses. Also, growing oyster reefs. Uh, it doesn't usually help um, for reducing storm surge height, but it can uh, it could help a little bit, and that's something we need to study more. Um, but it definitely can help for breaking waves, and that's one of those rebuild by design projects that I was a part of, and I'll show more on that in a minute. Also, next slide. So some work that was done, which is still um, the best uh, version of, that I can show for Jamaica Bay, we're still we're working on doing the next level of this, but it was done under a year ago to a year and a half ago under um, the mayor's special initiative on rebuilding resilience. And some of the co-authors are shown here on that work. Next slide. In this work, I'm not going to show the plots and the results in detail, but um, there were a few conclusions based on hydrodynamic modeling, which is my trade, um, with Arcadis, uh, Alent, uh, uh, scientists doing the modeling and, and, and others of us advising and in the room together working on adaptation strategies, we, we found that the massive wetland restoration, if you restore most of the wetlands in the, through the center or even go beyond restoration and add wetlands, fill Jamaica Bay center with wetlands, then you reduce a sandy plus sea level rise type flood event, really a huge flood event, only by about six inches. So, and the problem there is that there's a moat around, you know, a deep water pathway for the water, the deep dredge channels around the bay that go straight to the neighborhoods. 
And so without doing anything about that, the water still has a pathway and it avoids the wetlands, just goes around them. Um, now, and then focusing on that last point, I'll come back to the second point. Wetland restoration plus shallowing those channel depths to um, a very shallow depth, two meters, probably not palatable, but um, just sort of as a gross experiment to see what you can do. That does reduce the flood height for an event like that by three or four feet. So imagine reducing Sandy to where, um, to where it doesn't cause any flooding or Sandy with three feet of sea level rise, which is what we studied here, to where it causes a lot less flood. So if you can you know, reduce the water depths in those channels, then that's a new sort of green uh, engineering way of potentially re reducing flooding in the future. Um, so this one point in the middle, though, is where uh, now I'm starting to get to these unknowns. Um, the wetlands, it's more complex studying waves and erosion reduction, and, but the, um, the wetland, and also we haven't studied a, you know, the 10-year flood event, the five-year flood event. So those are things that we need to, to study more when it comes to making decisions on wetland restoration. And of course, there's many other benefits of wetland restoration, ecosystem benefits and societal benefits. I'm just talking about flooding. Okay, so now to talk about the, very briefly about the Rebuild by Design project and the oyster restoration uh, efforts. Um, and where they can lead. So our, this is just an experiment shown on the right. This is the um, skate team that um, won, was one of the winning teams um, with Parsons Brinkroff, Stevens Institute, and, and others on the team. New York Harbor School is represented here also. Um, and this is just one of the earlier experiments actually with Hurricane Donna where this is a control experiment at the top and the wave heights shown with colors um, with reefs along this area offshore in this, um, in this experiment we found a, a reduction of about one to four feet in the wave heights at the shore. So the idea is to reduce, reduce erosion um, from waves. It's to reduce wave overtopping from waves or the dangers of waves. It wasn't necessarily to reduce the storm surge. There's actually gaps between the reefs. So it's just something that would reduce the risk, not aiming to stop the risk entirely, which is sort of an innovation in itself. And so the thinking here um, that the team, and, and I think even New York City, Dan Zerilli, and all these other people over the past few years have contributed to this growing sense of how we can um, solve the problem of coastal flood air, at least reduce the risk, is not just through risk reduction from the physical threat, it's also to have, uh, to encourage the water culture through restoration of coastal systems in ways that encourages people to interact more with the water, understand the water, to know how, you know, to understand tides, potentially to know how to swim. All these other things can be other layers of resilience and protection in a way from being hurt by flooding. Um, and so by encouraging the ecology, and, um, improving waterfront access, having education programs on the waterfront, all these things are another form, another layer of resiliency. So we're not aiming to stop um, the, the, the physical danger, we're, we're aiming to reduce it, um, but also interact with it more and understand, have people understand it more, instead of being walled off from it. So um, last uh, slide, I think, is what are the unknowns? Um, so, and I'm not really going to talk about this as much as I'd like. Uh, in a few months, um, we'll have a report out from a new EPIC study led by Arcadis. I'm on, and I'm on this team, but the real um, leaders of the team are Hugh Roberts and his people at Arcadis, and they're working on, um, they're leading on this white paper that's going to summarize the unknowns when it comes to um, understanding green shorelines for New York City and how they can reduce, mainly how they can reduce flooding and wave damages. Um, but, um, so that's going to be coming out this fall. There's going to be a workshop associated that, with that also where people can come in and comment on that. Um, so another, a big unknown is the response. So this is kind of my shorter list of unknowns that come to mind. The response of natural systems to sea level rise is a big unknown, whether or not wetlands can grow with sea level rise. Oyster beds, I think, are more likely to be able to rise with sea level rise. So that's another piece of the appeal with oyster reefs and oyster beds. Um, another one is the efficacy of wetlands for stopping erosion and reducing waves. That's difficult because this point down at the bottom, the modeling, um, well, modeling of storm tides is relatively easy. Um, but modeling of water quality, sediment transport, ecosystems, and erosion are increasingly uh, more difficult as you go down that chain. So those are things that we could improve our knowledge about, and they would help, um, they could help with decision making on some of these topics. And lastly, socioeconomics, I mean, definitely the human side of this is a major, less predictable factor in the future of restoration and how it can be used to reduce flood. So my final conclusions. Storm tides in the New York, New Jersey Harbor have worsened since the 1800s and, and, and the first half of the 1900s, so they've been getting progressively worse. 
Sea level rise is also making flooding um, higher and more frequent, and, and we know that will continue in the future to get worse. We don't know about the storm tides issue, so we don't, since we don't understand it yet. Um, shallow and unused deep dredge channels could be an effective long-term green strategy over you know, many decades or even a century for, for unused shipping channels in some places. Um, and you can imagine the Meadowlands or Jamaica Bay as being a few places where that might be viable. Uh, wetlands can have benefits for reducing waves and erosion, but we need to quantify their role um, better for small, more frequent storms and for erosion. Um, and they can only reduce, it, it is key to mention that they can only reduce flood elevations if they cover a large area, not just fringing wetlands. And if there aren't deep channels that are circumventing that allow the floodwaters to go around them right into neighborhoods and ports. Thank you. Stick to my, if I stick to my uh, 20 minutes, we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Why did you use 37 years of data to figure out the flood frequency? There's a, um, I, there's a time period of 17 years, or of 36 years actually, um, where tides get, the highest tides get a little bit higher and smaller over a 36 year period. So that was a little bit of a factor in doing that. Another factor is, um, I mean, you can look at the whole 160 years of data that we had um, and do one, one assessment of return periods of flooding. Or if you want to do something that allows, um, that lets us look at how it's evolving over time, then some shorter time period that you run along through the data set. Can be used, and it could be 20 years. You know, with a 37-year time period, it, it's a good amount of time to look at a 10-year flood return period. It's four times 10 years, just about. So, so it's you know that was the other reason. So we can also take that data set and assume everything's stationary and that the tide, storm tides aren't changing, and take the whole data set and give you a 100-year flood estimate. But we know that things are evolving, so it's actually it points out how that's you know looking at the past when things are evolving is, is difficult, especially with climate change. Um, now that we don't know if we're changing storms with global warming. Jim? Phil, you mentioned the um, shallowing the channel in Jamaica Bay might, might be beneficial. Is, is, is that um, site specific to Jamaica Bay or, or the similar strategy work in maybe like a Newtown Creek or a one canal type scenario? You know, I haven't looked at those places, but they're shorter. Um, it, it, it basically increases the amount of friction and turbulence, the, water, the drag on the water trying to go through a shallower channel is kind of more like a bottleneck kind of approach. Um, it really works well there because you've got a 10 kilometer, if not more, pathway to places like Howard Beach from the open ocean and um, the water, even if it overtops the barrier line, it has to follow that pathway. So, I mean, it could be useful, but it definitely requires kilometers of distance to, to start to have an impact. Same thing with oyster reefs, you know, or something like that. Um, but in that case, it's because there's a channel that the water has to go through, so it allows the bottleneck sort of approach to, to be a factor. Um, Catherine? Um, I have some questions. Have you quantified under various scenarios how much cubic yards of materials we need to fill channels to a certain reduced depth at Jamaica Bay or at the Netherlands, for example? Uh, I may have peaked at it, but it's definitely beyond my radar. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to put out ideas and and, uh, and so, and we haven't had funding until now. We basically have funding just started recently to, to look deeper into this, uh, into these topics. Okay, uh, I better move on. I'm going to be my own uh, time dictator here. Uh, but I'd love to talk to people afterward you know, more about this. So I'm going to introduce Stephen Handel. He's a professor of ecology and evolution at Rutgers. Uh, he's our next speaker.